How does someone with a medical obstacle live normally? So I remember last year around the same time I was watching the seniors present their uh, SRPs, and I like how their stories told like something that they were passionate about, something that they could relate to, and just something that they really liked. And so when we started this uh, project five months ago, I took the same approach. I started listing stuff that I was passionate about, stuff that I could relate to, and stuff that I want to talk about and have been life changing. So as one, as I started listing stuff. I started talking about stuff like soccer, because soccer has been really life-changing. Uh, going to college soon has been something that is going to impact me. And uh, my sister growing up wanted to wear makeup, wanted to have a phone. It just like, really made me mad, because I don't want her to grow up. So I just kept listing stuff that like kind of like I feel close to as, as I went on with the list. One of the last things I listed were ITP and uh, torn meniscus. And then I realized that the only reason that they were the last things that I picked or because they were stuff that I did not want to talk about because of the effects that I felt because of these two medical issues. So that's what brought me to my question. How does someone with a medical obstacle live normally? Next slide, please. Okay, so let me tell my story. So beginning of junior year, everything was going uphill. Um, I was getting good grades, I was in varsity, and I was at practice one day, I went home, I collapsed. I was in the hospital for five days, got out, got uh, diagnosed with ITP. Later on, junior year, I was playing soccer again, tore my meniscus, and uh, so when I tore when I tore my meniscus and after uh, getting diagnosed with ITP, I felt similar traits with both of us, like uh, similar uh, theme I was going to say. And then I felt really lonely, I felt really hopeless, and I felt like sort of a um, situational uh, what is it, stress. And so like I started questioning, am I the only one that feels this? Do other people feel like this? Do they talk about it? And so that uh, so I went to go for talk with my little sister who had a stage two uh, sprained ankle. And uh, being that she's 10, she did not know how to express that she felt like lonely and like didn't know um, what to do. I, the things that she said, I kind of concluded that it meant that she was, you know, she needed some more help because she was crying a lot and she would tell me that she felt like she was never gonna walk again and she just kept complaining, complaining, complaining. And so, uh, so when I started looking for my question, uh, I, I started to specifically like, uh, focus on rare diseases because of my ITP, but my question, my solution is still going to answer to like more general, some more general like medical issues. Uh, next. So through my research, uh, the most, I did two, um, two of his um, interviews, one with Dr. Choi, a hematologist at UIC. He's constantly dealing with rare disease, rare disorders, and he told me that the hardest part of his job was telling people what they could and what they couldn't do. And to me, that was really shocking because I would have thought it was like doing the actual, like, you know, like doctor stuff. But it was actually telling people like, what they could and what they couldn't do. And I also interviewed Esmeralda. Stop for one second. Wait just a second. Can you quickly explain what ITP is? Oh, I was going to get to that. But. Oh, okay. <coughs> well, I'm talking about the internal. It's immune from the attic, purple. And for those, it's basically. Uh, uh, your plate account, which is what gives you scabs, it just kind of like uh, goes up and down depending on random days. So let's say on Friday, you have a high count of, uh, of platelets, you get a cut, your, your scab heals like really quick. Let's say it's Saturday and your platelet count is really low, you're, whatever, you get a cut and your platelet count is low, then it takes longer for it to heal, so it's pretty dangerous when it comes to sports. And so I guess that moves me on to my, uh, my Esmeralda topic. So Esmeralda is the second person I interviewed, and she's also an ITP, uh, she's actually a teacher, but she's also an ITP victim. And because she was already an older woman when she got diagnosed with ITP, it didn't affect her as much with the concept of like uh, physical stuff, it was just like uh, mental stuff that she dealt with. And she said that pretending that everything was okay was the hardest part of her job. Or I mean, uh, of her like, just acting to be normal. And then so I finished my interviews and then I went to hear stories about, or well, I looked up stories about other people with rare disease. And so Lucy, Lucy was one of the girls, she was diagnosed with Freiburg's disease, and she was a state champion dancer, and because of her constant like dancing, she developed this disease. And uh, at first she kept going, going, but then eventually got to the point where it was so bad that she needed to be in a boot for, on a boot for two months, and she said that for her, it was the worst thing ever, because she said, and it's quoted, her, she said, that two months for a dancer, she was like a year, and so she felt like, during these two months, like a year had gone through, she felt really, she didn't eat at times, she was like really down and she didn't like feel, like she needed someone's support. And I was able to relate to this because she felt like everything was gonna go downhill. I felt the same way when I got diagnosed with 
ITP. I felt like I was never gonna play soccer again. I felt like uh, just things were gonna go downhill from that on. I even sold my soccer shoes. That's how extreme I took it. Cause I was in a, I was pretty upset about this. And then uh, I also learned about uh, Cedric Bosa, and he was another ITP victim. And um, he was a basketball player. He was being scouted to go to college and play basketball in college. But since he got diagnosed, he wasn't allowed to play ITP anymore. I'm sorry, basketball anymore. And uh, so even though he wasn't able to play basketball, he took this like as a more on, um, he had the team support to like tell him that everything's gonna be okay. So uh, he wasn't able to play basketball, but his teammates were there and told him that, you know, apart from like his mom, his parents being there, they told, his teammate was there for him and told him that, you know, we got you, we're here for more support. And even though it, it impacted him still, his grades dropped a lot, but he was better off than most people. I mean, people think that get well, get well balloons and get well cards do something. I mean, for the most part, they do temporarily like, uh, like mood boosters, but after they're gone, it's like back to the old times. Uh, so when I was doing my research, uh, I said I was gonna be focusing more on rare diseases. So uh, I found out that there are 7,000 different rare diseases. And I also found out that one in 10 uh, people in America have a rare disease. But don't get scared, it's actually just 10%, one in 10, which seems too big. Uh, so 30% of kids with rare disease will not live past five five years old, and 95% of rare diseases do not have one single FDA approved treatment. Uh, I also learned that approximately 50% of rare diseases do not have a uh, do not have a specific foundation supporting or researching the rare disease. That means that there's no solution, there's no help for these people with uh, these other rare diseases or rare like um, like conditions. So I also talked, uh, I also researched about. Uh, post-surgery depression, and it's something that's not talked about, it's not communicated from doctor to patient, because it's something that doctors don't really like talking about, because depression itself is a topic that people don't like talking about. So like, I wanna say uh, pre-surgery, it's something that's never communicated, and therefore, it's like some, more, oftentimes, like this depression that comes after surgery, or like sense of like lon uh, loneliness, or however you wanna call it, if you don't wanna call it depression, um, it hits, and it hits it by surprise, and it just, they need someone there to help them. And so that's when I came up with my solutions. And I actually have multiple solutions. Uh, so while I was talking to Dr. Choi, the hematologist at USC, he told me that if I myself wanted to find a cure to any rare disease, including ITP, I would have to uh, be a study in biology and pursue my medical degree and study medicine. And the other one is to promote awareness for rare disease. There's, a, there's an event that happens every last day, last day of February in which uh, it's, uh, it's worldwide. On this day, they just do like marathons. They have like dinners and stuff to raise money for uh, and promote awareness for uh, what is it, rare diseases, and donate to uh, NORD. It's a national organization for rare diseases, and uh, this organization is like legit. I've checked it, so yes, hopefully donate, please. Uh, yes, and you could uh, also improve counseling in, in schools, like requiring counselors to talk to students, not just after like once they seek the help, like immediately after some type of medical um, issue comes across, like a surgery or just, just them being in the hospital, because oftentimes kids will not reach for, or not even kids, like people will not, uh, what is it, reach for the help, they will not ask for it, but they need it. And uh, also joining me on my journey to find uh, medicine to many rare diseases. Thank you.